when you live in a place designed for cars, a place cars are pretty much the only way you want to get anywhere when walking or biking or waiting for the bus. Those all seem like they're going to take too long. They'll distract you from getting everything you need to do done. That's where guys like Dan Fuller say, wait, hold on. Those don't have to be distractions, nor should they be. Dan Fuller runs the calculations on why that walk, that bus ride, that trip on your bike, that adds years to your life. It really helps your health. It also tends to make your community stronger. Dr. Daniel Fuller is our guest today on Researchers Under the Scope. Hi there, I'm your host, Jen Cannell, and today we're recording this virtually on the 10th of June, it's 2024, and I don't know about you, but I definitely used to wear an Apple Watch. Maybe you've had a Fitbit before. Maybe you've tried to track how many calories you're going to burn on that workout and the wearable really helps you do it. Maybe you've used AI to figure out, okay, what kind of exercise am I going to do? Give me a workout suggestion. All these things are up Dr. Daniel Fuller's alley. He's an associate professor in community health and epidemiology. He's a principal investigator on INTERACT. That's short for Interventions, Research and Action in Cities. Daniel Fuller is also a co-principal investigator of the Capacity Healthy Cities Implementation Science Team. Today, he's our guest. Hi, Daniel. Welcome to Researchers Under the Scope. Hi, Jen. How are you? I'm good. And I'm kind of looking at it going, okay, I get that. Yeah, probably walking's better for my health. Uh, cars aren't the greatest thing for my health. But how did, I mean, you grew up in Saskatoon, just like we're living here now. How did this become an interest for you? Uh, it really became an interest during my undergrad. Um, I was commuting from my parents' basement to the University of Saskatchewan and didn't really have the, you know, interest or will to take the bus. And I started riding my bike. Uh, you know, my parents bought me an old bike uh, and I rode my bike to university every day in the fall and then just kept on going and never stopped. And um, somewhere through the later part of my undergrad and master's degree, I realized, oh, you can actually study this active transportation, sort of sustainable transportation thing. And that I've been doing that ever since, really. Well, and at that point, like the sports were kind of a big part of your life, weren't they? Yes. Uh, yeah, I was a former canoe kayak athlete and participated in, you know, national and international level competitions in canoe kayak. Um, and then sort of let that go and focused on schooling uh, and really started to get into, you know, active transportation, how people move around cities and how we can get people active outside of the sport kind of environment. It would have been a real contrast when you moved to Montreal and started looking at more active ways of people getting around there. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, so I did my PhD in Montreal, um, and Montreal has always been one of Canada's leading cities in cycling infrastructure, active transportation, people getting around, um, you know, not using cars. Um, and it really was a major contrast to, you know, the way I moved in Saskatoon and the ease of which you could get things done, get your groceries, move around the city um, without having a car. So that was a, a sort of bit of a revelation in terms of what a city can look like or how you can design a city to, you know, make it easy for people to move around. What did you study there in particular? I studied uh, what's called the Big C Bike Share Program. So at the time in 2008, there's there was a, a new bike share program being launched in Montreal. Um, it was one of the first and the largest in North America at the time uh, in 2008. And no one really knew about the potential health impacts. Was this going to improve people's physical activity? Was it going to change their mobility, but also about the potential risk where there are going to be tons of car crashes, people crashing into bikes, people falling off their bikes and getting injured. Uh, and what were the impacts of that going to be? So with my PhD supervisor, we sort of had the opportunity to study this first sort of North American bike share program and look at, you know, is it going to change physical activity? Is it going to make people bike more? Is it going to create more injuries? And is it going to change how people move about the city? Are people going to 
start riding their own bikes? Are they going to take more transit because they can get off the bus and then get on a bike and bike very close to their house? Are they going to change sort of how they move through the city? So uh, that was basically the, the three broad questions of my PhD. How did you go about getting answers to that? Because it's not like every single Bixie is set up with like a video camera ready to interview people. How did you do it? <laughs> Uh, we did population, we, we did a bunch of different things, but the first thing we did was population-based surveys. So we interviewed about 4,000 people uh, four different times. So in the spring before the program launched, in the first fall of the program, in the second fall of the program, and the third fall of the program. So over the course of three years and asked them questions about how they use their bike, whether they involved in a crash on a Bixie bike or their own bike, uh, questions like, how have you changed your mobility? Do you use transit and Bixie? Do you use these other kinds of forms of mobility in Bixie. So we did that. We also had people at stations. So we did a, um, what's called an intercept survey. So basically we had a whole army of research assistants, undergrad students at stations for two different summers, um, just asking people extremely short, you know, two questions about, you know, where they're going and whether they like the bike share program. So we had, we did that for two summers and we also tracked a small number of people using accelerometers and GPS devices. So where they're going in the city, how they're using the, using the devices, those kinds of, of questions. What did the data tell you in the end? Um, so the high level summary is uh, people did bike more. So on average in the city, people started to use both use Bixie bikes more and use their own bikes more. So people, you know, saw people on the street on the Bixie bikes and they were like, oh, maybe I should get my bike out of the basement or out of the garage and, you know, start riding. So we saw that. Um, we didn't see any changes in collisions or crashes. Um, it's quite hard to study because crashes are quite, quite rare. Um, but we, we didn't see any change in the number of collisions, number of people going to the emergency room, those kinds of things. Hmm. Um, and we really saw changes in people's mobility. So many, many people described integrating the bike share program with transit or with walking or with other forms of sort of sustainable mobility, this broad term that's talking about, you know public transit, walking, cycling, or e-scooters or other kinds of mobility. So people really integrated the Bixie with other forms of transportation. Hmm. I remember visiting Montreal. I remember trying to never drive when I got to like the center island because it was just traffic would lock up. You, you literally could walk faster than a car could go. Was there more of an appetite for it there than you might see in, say, a smaller city like where we are now in Saskatoon? Uh, I think there's a few success factors that we know about now from having many, many more bike share programs implemented in North America. Uh, one of them is the scale. So a lot of cities tend to want to do a pilot project and do a small bike share and see if it works. So Ottawa is a good example of this. Uh, and that is a recipe for failure because the whole point of these, the whole way that these programs work is by network effects, by having a lot of bikes at a lot of stations. To have enough that you can just walk around and be like, oh, I'm going to get a bike right now and get one and go to where you need to go and have a have a large area. So it's a bit it's a bit tricky because cities don't typically don't want to invest in large scale programs right away. We can see that in Saskatoon with the e-scooter pilot program. But the the way that they're going to be the most successful is to have them as large and as as large as possible and deployed as rapidly as possible because they work on network effects, people being able to find them, people being able to use them um, and integrate them with their mobility. And people aren't afraid to take it more than like three or four blocks out of your city center. Like they want to go places. Yes. I mean, Bixie, the, in Montreal, the Bixie program, it, it got to the point where neighborhoods who were adjacent to the program who didn't have it were willing to pay the city to have the program come into their neighborhood because they knew that the residents in their neighborhood wanted it and they didn't have it and they were you know, advocating to the city and saying, hey, this needs to come to our neighborhood. This needs to come over here because we know people in our area are going to use it. Oh, that is awesome. Okay, so definitely some lessons learned. Go big or go home if you're going to do something like Big C or even the scooter shared. But yeah. from there, you also kind of moved into wearables. And I'm thinking about like my eye watch that I don't wear anymore. To be honest, it, it died like exactly at two years after I got it. So I'm like, okay, enough, Apple. Got all my money. But um Tell me a little bit more about where your research there kind of kicked in. Uh, so, yeah, this sort of came from um, I had an opportunity to apply for and be successful in receiving a Canada research chair uh, in what was called population physical activity. So the broad sort of tie in is how can we get people to be more active at the population level, kind of without sports or without 
these kinds of programs. So all the active transportation, cycling, walking stuff fits into that. Like how can we design cities to help people be just a little bit more active? I'm not saying you have to go wear, you know, wear spandex and go running and run marathons and do all these things. I'm not saying that. That's not what I want. I want people to walk for five more minutes every day or walk for two more minutes every day. Um, and when wearables started to become way more popular, um, that is another avenue that lots of people thought like, okay, maybe this is a way that we can encourage people to be slightly more active and, you know, study that and do that at a population level, large scale. Um, so I went to Memorial university and started a research program on, you know, wearable devices, uh, how wearable devices influence physical activity, but also how accurate are they and whether they're inequities in the accuracy. So whether, you know, men and women have different step counts, for example, or other kinds of questions. Like that. Uh, do we? Uh, yes, there are quite a few differences between men and women in terms of the devices. Um, so we know, for example, that for women, um, the calorie counting, so the energy expenditure or calories burned, uh, tends to be more accurate for women compared to men. Um, so I have a master's student who published her thesis on that uh, work. Uh, for step count, we, there's no differences between men and women as far as we know, but there are differences by body weight. So um, people who tend to be heavier tend to have less accurate step count measures. Same thing for age. People who tend to be older tend to have less accurate step count measures. Oh, man, because I remember getting like to the end of my day and you're trying to close your rings and you're like, oh, if I just go to the basement and like, well, I could go on the treadmill, I could dance, I got to walk or, or like just walking loops around the block trying to like make the ring close. I mean, it felt motivational, but I also realized I was staying up really late at night, like trying to get these stupid things closed. Like by the end of that day, I was like playing with time zones. I just wanted to game the system wherever I could. But do they make people take that extra two minutes to walk or extra five minutes to walk? Um, the jury's kind of out on that. I would say there's a reasonable amount of research that shows that, yes, they can encourage people, but it's quite challenging to sustain that. So. You get your device, you've had it for two weeks. You're like, yes, let's do this. I'm going, I'm doing my thing. And then about six months later, you you go, oh, it buzzed at me. Eh, I'm going to ignore it. And then most people after like in your case, you're, you're right on bang on. Most people after a year or two, either it gets old and they don't wear the battery's dying or they just kind of give up and, and it sits in a drawer somewhere. So, um, Sort of, that's one of the challenges that we've learned over the years about these types of devices is they can help motivate you, but it's hard to sustain motivation. And that's for any, any type of physical activity. It's not only the watches problem. It's if you have a personal trainer, if you have a, you know, if you have a running buddy, if you're doing bad, if you're doing cycling, just very difficult to maintain motivation over time. Well, and I think that's why the idea of just building a little bit more of a walk, like if I had a bus that came by my house every 10 minutes instead of once every half hour or maybe an hour and then, oh, no, if I missed it, I'm really hooped now. But I feel like it wouldn't take that much more to kick me out to my bus stop. OK, can I get the groceries bought? Can I still pick up kids from activities? I do feel like I've gone and built my life in a city where adding transportation, like active walking and active biking is oh, it's something that people without kids can do, or it's something that not so busy people can do. And I don't love that. I love how when I go traveling, I do feel like I'm walking a lot more. Yeah. Yeah. And that's sort of a classic story that, you know, you, I hear from family members and other people saying, oh, we went to we went to Montreal or we went to Portland or we went to other another place and we walked and it was great. And we did all these steps. Um, I think that there's the challenge is how do we connect those those two things i loved it when i went there and did the did my holiday there and then how do i do that or how do i make that happen here in the place that i live which maybe isn't as walkable or maybe it has a different you know structure of how the city's built or my life is there so i'm not on holidays and i have to you know get groceries and get kids and do all those kinds of things so that's that's sort of part of where the challenge comes in yeah and i also I think about all the pressure that we put on our politicians to like fix the potholes. I don't want to keep wrecking my car. Make, give us an extra lane on circle. It's getting really congested. We kind of push them as voters to spend like hundreds of millions of dollars on maintaining what we've got for car infrastructure. But I also live in a city where we've ripped out our bike lanes downtown, like right past my job. Um, what what can we do to make some of these things more doable 
for local politicians, from especially at the municipal and provincial level, to make active transportation just a little bit more attractive? Yeah, it's a very tricky problem, and lots of cities have gone through various struggles on how to do this. Um, Saskatoon has, continues to go through some of those struggles right now, um, having some pilot projects, um, but really thinking about how we can um, develop support for, for these types of infrastructure. And it's hard when you haven't experienced these types of infrastructure or don't have that kind of experience. That's on the individual side of things, right? I saw this in Montreal, or I did this in another city. Um, on the other side, so on the municipal city council side or city staff side, it's really important to have quite a bit of leadership because there's always going to be lots of pushback in these kinds of things. Um, and the typical sort of what we see, and you know, I have colleagues at Simon Fraser University who've done social media analyses of you know of Twitter and Facebook, looking at okay, before a bike lane is implemented, you know, you have all of this uproar on social media and everyone's angry and it's a big fight and all these things. And then the city implements the infrastructure and then it's crickets. No one is bothered at all by the thing. <laughs> um, so, you know, we haven't experienced exactly that in Saskatoon, but the Calgary, uh, in Edmonton and Calgary and in Victoria, you know, we've seen examples of that, that happen. Um, so leadership is really important, especially from the mayor or other city councillors to sort of try to make this happen, but it's a tricky problem and it's a local problem. So we can take what we learned from Edmonton and, you know, Winnipeg and other places, but at the end of the day, we're not those places. So that makes it tricky. Yeah. So you need strong leadership, but your mileage may vary. Okay. Yeah. Where do you see those wearables and maybe AI being able to help you measure just how people are doing with a little bit incorporating a bit more physical activity into their lives. Like, what questions do you see yourself being able to answer now? Yeah, so that that's really where, you know, it's they're a little bit disparate, but really the ultimate goal is to try to marry this city urban planning stuff and this health stuff um, to try to be able to answer questions like, okay, if we implement a bike lane, how much health benefit is there? Or how many health dollars might we save? Because health care is our biggest expenditure provincially. And if we can save money on health, then that's really, really important, both for municipal politics and provincial politics. Um, so if we can get really good numbers on, okay, if we implement these policies, if we, you know, Saskatoon is implementing bus rapid transit, when we implement bus rapid transit, how, what's the health impact of that going to be? How much are we going to save? What does that look like uh, at a very precise kind of detailed level? We can do kind of surveys and modeling studies that are not very accurate, um, but how can we do that at a a very high level or the same thing in the opposite sense if we build you know five more freeways what is the potential negative or positive health impact of, the, of doing that right because a lot of this research tends to focus on the things that might help benefit physical activity like cycling infrastructure or bus rapid transit or those kinds of things um, but we also need to think about what's happening on the other side with what happens if i drive another 20 minutes every day uh, because it's more accessible, because I'm driving around, that's those kinds of things, what happens to my health, quality of life, those sorts of questions. Yeah, I'm still sitting, <laughs> sitting down behind the wheel of a car, emitting a bunch of fumes, depending on what kind of car you're driving. Um, it, it, it does seem like it, it's a lot to marry those two, but are there sort of more practical projects that you're involved in, even over the coming year or two, that that we're starting to see some light? Yeah, so we have a few projects with the city of Saskatoon. So for example, one of the big challenges uh, that the city has is for cars, we have like level of service. So basically that means if there's this number of cars going across the street, you know, we need this many lanes and we need either stop signs or street lights. There's sort of like formulas or guidelines on how do you build a road depending on how many cars, what type of infrastructure do you need in terms of stop signs, stop lights, you know, number of lanes, those kinds of things. But we don't have any information about that for pedestrians. Ooh. So if you think about downtown in the summer when it's busy, you know, the sidewalk's full, people are waiting on the side of the street, you know, it, it's hard to figure out how much service, i.e. how wide a sidewalk might pedestrians need, how, how might we design the city for pedestrians. So we have a project that we're just in the process of starting. Uh, one of the challenges, the city doesn't have good data on where all the sidewalks are, how wide they are those kinds of things. So we're oh. working, many cities don't, this is very common. 
So we're working on, we're using some satellite imagery data to try to use AI to detect sidewalks and then to develop basically pedestrian level of service. If there's this many pedestrians on a sidewalk, how wide should the sidewalk be? How far away should it be from the street? Should there be parking on that side of the street or not? Um, these kinds of questions. We already have basically good ideas of that for vehicle level of service, but we don't have good ways to do that for pedestrians or cyclists, but we're working on it for pedestrians at the moment. Huh. And what is the impact on my health? If I could say build in 10 extra minutes of walking max a day, you know, like, I, I, is there much of a change if I have those little incremental gains? The, the yes, uh, I always say physical activity is really good for you. The in incremental gain, the biggest incremental gain of physical activity is going from no activity to five minutes a day. So the biggest bang for your buck in terms of health benefit, almost of anything, is going from zero minutes of activity to five. And then the next best is from five to 10. And it slowly diminishes, um, but adding any 10 minutes a day is, is extremely beneficial. Even five minutes a day has incredible health benefits. What kind of benefits? It improves mental health, reduces depression, improves type two diabetes, improves COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, prevents certain forms of cancer, breast cancer, colon cancer. Um, physical activity is like this magic thing that does so, has so many benefits and you only need a little bit of it every day. And it's like, we're built for it, but then we went and built our city so we wouldn't need to. Precisely. Yeah. That's such a struggle. Um, I guess in the future, uh, where are you hoping that some of this work will lead you? There's two kind of areas that I think I'm focused on right now. One is really trying to understand combining how we combine this sort of wearable device, AI kind of stuff with urban planning and how we design cities. Okay. So for example, if you've thought about combining the walking mode detection kind of work from the wearable devices with the pedestrian level of service kind of sidewalk work with urban planning policies that a municipality might use, you could say, okay, we know this many people are walking on this sidewalk. We know that we should have this kind of a sidewalk. City staff or municipal or city council, you go ahead and design the policy and do that the work that you need to make us meet our service requirement, uh, the city service requirement, for example. Um, so that's one thing. And then the other thing that I'm working on quite a bit right now with the capacity team uh, is just understanding how cities are the same and how cities are different and why some cities are really good at doing cycling infrastructure or transit or other things and why other cities, you know, struggle a bit more or have a few more challenges. So it's more kind of policy thinking about, you know, why is v Victoria, BC, the leader in cycling infrastructure in Canada uh, and, you know, Guelph, not so good and sort of working to do that. So it's sort of the combination of municipal policy, politics, provincial policy and politics, federal policy and politics, and how that all plays out into you know, what actually gets built in your city. Because at the end of the day, for most people, that's all you see. But there's a whole political hierarchy of kind of very complicated things happening in the background for who's paying, how much are they paying, how fast does it have to happen? All these kinds of questions that we don't have good generalized kind of science about. We have, oh, Montreal did it this way because these reasons, but we don't, we haven't studied why certain cities are the same or different. Yeah. And I mean, in my brain, I'm like, oh, all those European cities were hard to get around the city center because they were built before cars. There were no cars. They kind of were an aftermarket thing. Whereas out in most parts of North America, we built from scratch. Like, and we were like, oh yeah, cars, bring them in. Let's build for them. Let's spread everything out and everybody can have their own single family home. It does feel like such a struggle. It's it's encouraging to know that you're you're fighting the good fight. Is there any one thing that you would change, I guess, about the city you live in right now, if you could just wave a magic wand, snap your fingers and boom, it happens? I don't think there's one thing. I think maybe the one thing would be just increasing the density of housing and availability of homes across the city, but particularly in the core areas of the city. That's kind of the one magic thing that you need to have a lot of other things. If you don't have enough density, then it's hard to have a grocery store because there's not enough people to shop at the store. If you don't have enough density, it's hard to have a school because there's not enough kids to go to the school. If you don't have enough density, it's hard to justify transit because, you know, density is kind of one of those key drivers of, of you know, urban form, transit, accessibility to services, all that kind of stuff. So if I had one magic bullet, I guess I'd say more density, 
especially in the core areas. Uh, and then, and then yeah, we'll see what happens. Well, I really appreciate you talking to us here on Researchers Under the Scope. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you very much. Dr. Daniel Fuller is a principal investigator on Interact. That's Interventions, Research and Action in Cities. He's a co-principal investigator on the Capacity, emphasis on City, Health Cities Implementation Science Team. And he's one of Canada's leading researchers figuring out how to use artificial intelligence in public health training. He's also an associate professor of community health and epidemiology at the University of Saskatchewan's College of Medicine. You can find Dan Fuller on social media at Walkabilly. Just sort of smash the two words walkable and hillbilly together and there you go, Walkabilly. Researchers Under the Scope is a presentation of the Office of the Vice Dean of Research at the University of Saskatchewan's College of Medicine. This podcast was recorded and produced on Treaty 6 territory, and we pay our respect to the First Nations and the Métis ancestors of this place. We reaffirm our relationship with one another, and we'd sure like to thank you for tuning in. I'm your host, Jen Cannell, and if you can find those little dots up in the corner, tell a friend about this episode of Researchers Under the Scope. Put some headphones on, go for a walk, listen to it. The whole idea is to have a healthier future together here on Researchers Under the Scope.